this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Over 25 years helping leaders reducing errors and incidents. Here is your host of the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast, Rob Fisher. Hi, and welcome to the Essential Leadership Cycle Podcast. Uh, this is your host, Rob Fisher, coming to you from the AeroHP.com studios here in Concord, North Carolina. I'm joined today by Ms. Judy Disney, uh, semi-related by name, uh, three generations, nine removed, second cousins, <laughs> cousins. brothers. We're, uh, it's wishful thinking. They're they're related to the Disney's, and, <laughs> and I married into and, it. and she mar- and she married into it. <laughs> so it took her a while to get there, but uh, uh, if you recognize the name, that's why. Uh, Judy has been a, a consultant in human performance for a decade, <laughs> and and probably one of the longest uh, and most sought after human organizational performance consultants out there. Uh, because she's been all over the world and in multiple languages. And uh, I wanted to take an opportunity here on the Essential Leadership Cycle podcast to talk to Judy about the Essential Le- Leadership Cycle and the power that it has in expanding to advanced error reduction as opposed to um, turning leaders loose on their own. So first of all, welcome, Judy. You want to tell people about a little little bit about your experience, and then we'll, we'll jump into uh, talking about the essential leadership cycle. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm thrilled to be here today. And um, my experience uh, comes out of the aluminum industry. Uh, I worked for Alcoa, and I was a frontline supervisor for the majority of my lifetime career there and then eventually promoted to general supervisor and to manager. So during my opportunities to advance in that organization, I I discovered how important leadership is. I also discovered how decisions get made by leaders. And so I... uh, I was really excited when I originally met you back in the about 2006 and um, got excited about human performance and taking that back to our facility. And as a result of that, we started that HP journey. And, um, and of course, we, uh, we learned right from the beginning, I, I have to say, that as I was a manager by that point and working with the lead team of managers and plant manager that we, we told ourselves right then and there that the only way we could be successful is if we owned this and that we had no one to blame except ourselves right. if it failed. So it became a journey because it isn't something that you're going to change. Unfortunately, I don't have a light switch or a Disney magic wand <laughs> to make it just change overnight. But we started that journey and and learned a whole lot of things along the way. Yeah. And then eventually when you retired, you you kind of fell in love with the, yeah, the with, teaching and consulting part of it yeah, and so, came on board with us. Yeah, because the exciting part for me is that it changes individuals' lives as well as organizational success. Yeah. Right? And so... For me, it was just like, wow, this is really something that I'd like to carry on to other people. So I've been really fortunate to spend 10 years, the last 10 years, and hopefully another 10 years with the Rob Fisher organization and um, and helping individuals as well as organizations become better and intentional in what they do. Yeah, so you, you lived through the days when leaders could really um, – pick and choose, we like to call it cherry picking, what they want to do. Uh, How has it changed now that we've got the essential leadership cycle, specifically on the self and team awareness, shared vision and values? I certainly want to pull the string on diversity and inclusion with you, but but having the the essential leadership cycle, how has that changed how you're able to approach uh, leaders? Well, it really helps leaders see that they've been picking and choosing what they choose to do, as well as now they recognize, I believe, that in order to have self-awareness and team awareness to go to be able to complete the whole cycle, to, to be able to truly have uh, 
continuous improvement. That's what we always wanted way back when. Well, in, in order to get that, there's a cycle that you go through to get to that. And it really, the first three are key to building the trust. We have to have the vision and the values and, and do they really exist amongst the leadership as well as the rest of the team? Yeah. And, and have you seen in organizations you've gone into that there were mismatches, that the, that the organization wasn't self and team aware and didn't really share vision of values, but they thought they did? Oh, yeah, because I've gone into, you know, probably 100 different organizations at this point, and, uh, and it's going to be different in each one. Right. But when I get in there, that's the first thing that I look for is, is there a match between what their vision and values are to whether or not the folks are really engaged in that? Do they really value those same things? Yeah. And uh, the, the mismatch is oftentimes the predominant one. And so that you have to help leadership get out there and do engagements to see Right. What is really exists out there in their workforce? Yeah. And if I mean, if you if they see a mismatch in in a, a few engagements, they're pretty sure that those are driving some of the problems. Exactly. But those tend to not reveal themselves in typical method observations, do they? That's right. They don't. The methods are just going out and seeing if people are doing what they're supposed to when they're supposed to do it. And if I'm there observing them do that more than likely they're going to stick pretty much to that method. Yeah. But a conversation, an engagement that's just a conversation about what that value or what that indicator or what that element means to someone, that's a completely different set of information gathering. It it is completely different, right? Because I may just have somebody who tells me I'm just a bricklayer and I just lay bricks one at a time. Or when I ask the other fellow, what are you doing here? He may say, I'm building a cathedral. And he may be the same bricklayer doing the same thing. But his vision and value of what he's doing and the expertise that he wants to do it with is way different than the guy who just says, I don't know, I just use mortar and brick. And, And why do you think that's important for leaders to know? Because if they truly want to be able to achieve what they have visioned or valued for the organization, it is about engaging each of those individuals and helping them get that same vision because that's the best way to get there. Otherwise, you're not going to have that desired outcome. A small mistake made by somebody that is just laying bricks, uh, this brick and this mortar, um, doesn't seem like much to that individual until that small mistake is translated into the wall of the cathedral and now upsets the entire attribute. Right. They may have made a mistake that the foundation isn't laid properly on a particular section or a wall, and now it becomes a major issue. Right. And that, I mean, that's just a, just a a story Mm -hmm. that would work almost anywhere. Mm -hmm. doesn't matter really what type of organization you're in. That's right. Uh, while I've got you here, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion. Um, you, you, one of the ways that we describe uh, diversity and inclusion is diversity is a fact. It's a condition. We're diverse. Mm-hmm. Um, but inclusion is a choice. It's actually an action that people have to take. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of the diversity that we we really want to focus on is diversity of thought. Well, that's something that you can't see, even though it's a condition. You and I may think differently, but until we have a way that our personalities can get that out on the table, number one, we don't know that there's diversity of thought. So number two, we don't know whether we are really are or are not being inclusive. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey on that because, you know, I I like to hear how someone that, uh, with your background, I guess you've got your, your master's. I do. Mm-hmm. In I have a master's in business. And I have an undergrad in psychology. Okay. So it has, I think, uh, served me well in yeah. what I do. Um, and that master's in business, I, I liked to focus some of my master's on leadership is where my focus was and, and the importance of how leaders think and see differently and and act on that differently. 
So if we're talking about diversity, we want to have a wide range of different types of leaders in the organization, but we want them to be able to freely be able to discuss their um, perceptions and beliefs, perhaps, and values of how they think something should be done. And, and in some organizations, that's not possible. I have lived through some of those uh, yeah. leadership times where it wasn't comfortable to share um, my perceptions and beliefs or how I thought something should be done. It was a dictatorship, basically, that was telling me how I had to run my department or what I had to do. Where other opportunities, leadership changes, and now um, the inclusion piece comes that it's okay to share your thoughts. We may not always go with what you think, but we can sit in a round table of, as leaders with diverse thoughts, and we can listen and then decide how to move forward yeah. and what might be best. But if we don't open up to diversity and inclusion, so again, diversity, uh, a lot of organizations uh, want physical diversity, right. and, and, and that's, that's a great value. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the things the essential leadership cycle does is it drives people to look for diversity and inclusion of thought, thought. Uh, diversity and inclusion of perception by personality tendency. Right. So as we as we learn, um, especially using the personality tendencies, a leader who might normally come across as not being receptive to listen can now learn to manage their tendencies so that they show up differently and invite other personalities who might not willingly speak up to be able to speak freely yeah. about. And, um, and so I'm one of those personality tendencies that I can kind of go either way where I can just show up and blab or I can sit back and I can listen and decide whether or not I feel safe to share. Right. right. Yeah. Just depending on, on the situation. So uh, it's really nice now to have see leadership who will invite people le less likely to speak up to speak up. And so now they can share and they can feel comfortable and really be a, be a part of the vision and the values and the proceeding forward with self-awareness as individuals as well as teams. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, good. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. Is sure. there anything else that you can think of that – that the listeners of the Essential Leadership Cycle podcast can glean from your decades of experience in this? Hmm. I think if there's anything that um, they could glean from my experience is to, to really embrace the human performance and the e-colors, right, into embracing the fact that what they do with it on a daily basis matters. I think if I've learned anything, it's working and using it daily in my life everywhere, not just at work. Makes it a lot easier to apply it at work. It does. And it works both places. That's right. Yeah. So when you get comfortable with the people that you love and can talk about this, it makes it that much easier to go to work yeah. and share it with your coworkers. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Well, Judy... Disney, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And we will chat with you next time on the Essential Leadership Cycle podcast. Thanks. This has been your host, Rob Fisher. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.